Hello, world singers. My name is Brooke. And I'm Tyler. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Hello, hello, all you lovely people out there. We had a bunch of wonderful responses from our last episode, which was all about Six of the Dust and the special sequel chapter that we read. There are so many theories, and because we've now finished up with our Rhythm of War reread, or really just read once, but then (laughs) read multiple other times. Read once and then talk about forever. (laughs) Because we finished up with that part of the podcast, now it's back to the old bread and butter, which is crazy theories. And the Six of the Dust was like a great jumping off point for multiple crazy theories. That one deals with the future and the far future of the Cosmere. But today we're going to go into the past and the future. And the future. Exactly. What is time? This is a question that we will answer slash ask mostly in the course of this podcast episode there's my thesis going back to the future (laughs) it's gonna be wonderful this is also a very special episode because we have a special guest someone who has been mentioned on the podcast a couple of times a nerd extraordinaire someone who has put together a spreadsheet that i am proud of and this is my little brother Aaron, welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Thanks, guys. It's uh, that's a very apt description. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to have Aaron on because he pitched as a listener of the pod, as everyone is. You can follow us on Reddit and all the social medias. You know, find us on the Facebook and whatnot. But as a longtime listener of the podcast, Aaron saw a weakness in our repertoire where we had mentioned or talked about. A very important part of the Cosmere, and specifically the Stormlight Archive, but we didn't have a single episode that really looked at and explored in depth the death rattles. Yeah, I've seen multiple people on the internet, especially recently for some reason, throwing out a bunch of theories kind of grounded in the death rattles, and Aaron is both incredibly nerdy and incredibly smart. You would think that he had a copper mind because he just can store a ridiculous amount of information in his brain. (laughs) And so he has put together this lovely spreadsheet kind of breaking down all of the death rattles and speculating on what they might mean for the future of the Cosmere. And so we are going to first invite Aaron to share what he believes is kind of like an in-game theory, or at least one in-game theory, from the evidence that he gathered in all of these death rattles. And then we're going to go through talking about Aaron's theory, as well as some of the other theories that fans have thrown out or that Brandon has softly confirmed that all swirl and are connected to the death rattles. So Aaron, with that introduction... Tell us what you think is kind of an in-game theory for at least Stormlight Archive 5, or are you talking about in-game all the way out to 10? No, so I'm talking about just up to 5. I definitely don't have enough information to be in any way like confident yeah. <laughs> on speculating that far out. Um, but at least for 5, I feel like we have a lot of information and we can really... Uh, dial in on the themes of the book and the themes of the characters that we're looking at and using some death rattles, some of which Brooke pointed out to me and the pod pointed out to me, which uh, just kind of building off of those. And one of the things that I noticed as being really important to what's going on is that after race makes the deal with Dalinar, he, you know, he storms over to Teravangian, which is like the God version of like coming home and getting angry at your spouse. Cause something bad happened at work. Uh, and, <laughs> And gets super pissed at him because he says he's trapped in a deal he doesn't want to be in. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the number one, like the only thing that matters to Odium at this point is getting out, is getting away from Roshar and just being free, being able to leave. Because at least it's implied that the power he holds wants out. And that's why it's like destroying him. It's one of several reasons that could be the case, but Mm -hmm. that seems to be one of them. So because of that, 
if Odium wins, if he wins the duel and kills Dalinar, he's still trapped on Roshar. He still doesn't get to leave based on the agreement that they've made. Yeah. If he loses, of course, he doesn't get to leave. So actually winning or losing the duel doesn't matter that much to Odium in the long run. Mm -hmm. What's important for him to do is make Dalinar break the agreement that they've made. Because yeah. as Dalinar is the acting, you know, part of honor, we've already had indications that if Dalinar breaks a, his word or breaks a deal like that, it'll cause basically if Odium breaks their deal, right, it would make him weak enough that cultivation could kill him. Yes. So if Dalinar breaks their deal, what would happen to Dalinar, right? He, obviously, it wouldn't be good for him. And it could the break the bonds that are holding back Odium. And maybe let him leave or escape Rashar if, you know, the, oh, the force that the... Dalinar represents is not able to maintain whatever magical bonds there hmm. are. In That's the an interesting thought. I didn't take it that far. I was more thinking like he has been trying to break Dalinar for so long, like just because Dalinar is obviously an excellent leader of men. And mm -hmm. so like getting rid of such an important leader could be a big blow to humanity but that's an interesting thought that it also may have to do with dalinar's like pseudo honorness yeah that he's like kind of what's left of honor a little bit and they kind of imply that when the two of them are talking because mm -hmm. odium says if i break my word right it's gonna put a hole in me it's gonna hurt me significantly yes. and if it doesn't hurt Dalinar significantly, I think at the very least, as he's bonded to the Stormfather and to honor mm -hmm. kind of, it would cause issues with the Stormfather at the very least, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Love that. We're going to circle back to that as we go through some of these death rattles. Uh, continue, absolutely. Aaron. That's sort of just a like a, a foundation point I wanted to bring up, but that doesn't really relate. Like no death rattle indicates that that might be the case. The big death rattle that everybody sort of that you guys brought up on the pod and that it seems to be a prevailing theory is the the child one, right? The yeah. suck, I hold the yeah. sucking yeah. child in my hands and and kill them. And obviously that's ooh, there's a lot that goes into that one. But what people think is going on is that Odium's champion is going to be a, a child of some kind mm -hmm. and it's gonna have to be a force to, you know, down yeah, or to or win the battle, you would have innocent. to kill the child. Yeah. Yeah, some kind of innocent. But what stood out to me in like the wording of their agreement is they said that both combatants, both champions are allowed to meet at the top of Urethiru mm -hmm. unmolested by either side's forces. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing in their agreement that says that the, the champions can't attack innocent bystanders, that it go doesn't go the other way around. So even yeah. if, you know, because it's supposed to be a willing combatant, which you guys right. have brought up before, that a child, it's hard to argue that they yeah. can be a willing combatant. But even if they're not, he could have his champion grab a hostage. If Dalinar's nephew is there watching, he could, or if for whatever reason, Kaladin's brother is there for whatever freaking reason, if uh, his mom <laughs> brings him to a death yeah. match, I don't know why she'd do that. But <laughs> <laughs> My yeah, point is I that think, no, I, I think that's a really good point that I hadn't thought of that there <laughs> could be, bystanders or like other shenanigans at play yeah that that somehow they're going to force dalinar into a situation where in order to keep his like honor and like the way that he sees the world he's not going to be able to let an innocent person die and that because he refuses to fight after having already been declared as a champion mm -hmm. the battle is to the death so if dalinar refuses or backs out that's going to break the I, i'm not sure if that's going to break it or if that just results in him forfeiting yeah i feel like it would be a forfeit be a forfeit but it is very interesting like what could be the result of dalinar failing in a we'll call it like a non-traditional way i think that there is at least some speculation that what you mentioned about Raisa coming back and, uh, you know, ye yelling and shouting about the deal that he doesn't want to be in could actually be the moment that the power of Odium decides officially that, like, Raisa is no more. This vessel sucks. Exactly. <laughs> and I need a new one. Uh, even though the power was definitely, like, working kind of that direction, it does seem like that's the big failure point. And so I love the idea that, like, what 
Rasa vocalized as a failure is a failure to Odium. Odium, the power, kicks out Rasa, gets the new vessel, and then is still bound by these rules, but now has the vessel of Teravangian to find all of these loopholes. So I definitely think that the most dangerous thing, as Harmony has told us, is when the vessel and the power are perfectly in line with what they want and what they are capable of. And Mm -hmm. I do think that this, I don't know what it is, and I don't want to offer more speculation than already exists, but I do think that what you are hinting about a child being taken, a hostage type of situation, uh, or an inability for Dalinar to continue leading to a forfeit, that's definitely a way of like subverting expectations of a traditional duel, which we know that Brandon loves to do as well. And that is one one super popular theory, of course, that we have seen everywhere. I've also seen other death rattle theories uh, specifically pointing to certain death rattles that seem like they are foreshadowing Kaladin's oaths. So I thought that was interesting. Why don't we kind of dive into the text of the death rattles and talk about some of these more specifically? Absolutely. Yeah, you were just talking about Kaladin's mm-hmm. uh, rattles, and those are honestly the Kaladin's death rattles are honestly the uh, some of the easiest ones to parse. Yeah, so I think it might be best to just look at to a certain extent. <laughs> I was gonna say, okay, so you're like totally on board with the theory that these death rattles are definitely foreshadowing Kaladin's oaths. I, I do subscribe to the theory that I think there is a death rattle for each of Kaladin's oaths, just okay. because there are three that are super on the nose describing what's going on. Okay. Okay. Um, do we each want to take one? Yeah, give them to us. Yeah, start start us off. Which do you think is really clearly about one of Kaladin's oaths? So let me start with the first one, Okay. which is, Above the final void I hang, friends behind, friends before. The feast I must drink clings to their faces, and the words I must speak spark in my mind. The old oaths will be spoken anew. End quote. And that one is just a dead ringer to me for the moment where Kaladin runs across the bridge and leaps across the chasm to fight the Parshendi and save Dalinar. The end um, of Way of the, Kings. Yeah, what is yeah the, in the Way of Kings. What's the feast in so that if you, one? If you remember from that scene, so let, I'm just going to start from the beginning. Oh, I and guess I'm the go gemstones? Along. Yeah, exactly. So Got it. The, the final void is obviously the chasm. The friends behind him are his bridge crew. The yeah. friends before him are Dalinar's group. Um, the feast I must drink, cling to their faces, is the the gemstone jewelry that all the Parshendi wear on their faces, uh-huh. and that gives him enough stormlight to to fight against them. And then, of course, he says both of his oaths when he makes that leap. He says the the first one and the second one uh, when he does that. Yeah, okay. I think that's a great yeah. call. There is another one that I have for his fourth oath that we saw in mm-hmm. Rhythm of War. Mm-hmm. And this one is, quote, in the storm I awaken, falling, spinning, grieving, end quote. Definitely seems like that moment when he is falling off the cliff of Urethiru and swears the fourth ideal. But do we have a death rattle for his third ideal or is the last one about speculation for the fifth? So I believe there is one for his third ideal and it has, it's on more shaky ground than I think the other two. The other two seem pretty clear to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even before the fourth book came out, there were people theorizing that in the storm I awaken was for the fourth, his, him swearing his fourth ideal. But for the third one, I think it is this one, which is quote, all is withdrawn from me. I stand against the one who saved my life. I protect the one who killed my promises. I raise my hand. The storm responds. And when I first saw this, I didn't believe that it was for the third one until I reread uh, Words of Radiance, because in Words of Radiance, at the moment when he says his third ideal and, and like awakens, he literally waves his hand out. He like puts his hand out and the storm crashes through the hole in the wall and the whole, whole hallway lights up, which was a pretty indicator to me that this was a pretty good indicator that this was the the death rattle. That's a great call. I didn't even remember that part of Words of Radiance. So thanks for bringing that back. Yeah. That's why, since these all seem pretty, like, correct, that's why I think there there's almost certainly going to be a fifth death rattle for his fifth oath. 
but there's a couple different candidates it could be. Oh, okay. Um, so let's yeah. take a listen at some of the candidates, which... The one I think is the most likely to be correct is, quote, I'm standing over the body of a brother. I'm weeping. Is that his blood or mine? What have we done? Hmm. End quote. Hmm. Um, the reason I think that's Kaladin is one, it's super angsty, which is right up Kaladin's <laughs> alley. Um, that's perfect. <laughs> And two, I'm standing over the body of a brother. Very is very indicative to me of like Kaladin's relationship with not only Bridge Four but with Mosh as well. That yeah. Kaladin has trouble realizing that one of his friends is a terrible, terrible person who needs to die. Harsh. And he will still view Mosh as a brother, even at this point, even with Teth dead, he's still gonna have trouble killing Mosh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I certainly think he still has like a really deep sense of like loss, but he's still clinging to the idea that Moash is very close to him like a brother. Well, and then I think there is, for Kaladin specifically, who was saved by Bridge Four mm, and mm -hmm. sees himself as like literally a different person. Like his old self died and he was reborn in part because of Moash, in part because of Rock and all of Bridge Four. It's very difficult then because to kill... Moash is to kill part of yourself, kill your parent, kill, you know, it's yeah. not just like a person that he met. It is. He's like representative of Bridge Four, which is so essential to who Kaladin is. Yeah, it's much more like taking out a piece of yourself. And that is difficult for anyone to do. But I think that these are all both great. It makes a lot of sense that Brandon would have a general or at least a we think a fully fleshed idea of like what Kaladin is going to experience and go through as he progresses from one oath to the next and as the main character or one of the main characters that we're following through the Stormlight Archive it definitely makes sense that the oaths that he swears would all be hidden in the way of kings. Aaron so do you think that Kaladin is going to kill Moash? At some well, point? I, I don't know. I think they're definitely going to have a confrontation. I think that's just been built up at this point. As for if he's going to kill him, it's so unclear, especially going off of this death, death rattle. I mean, this one could even be from Moshe's perspective, if we think about it, because... Standing over it, Kaladin. It seems to me like someone waking up, right, and like realizing what they've done after they've done it, which could be just, you know, the fugue of battle, but it could also be that... Mosh, after he kills Kaladin, like snaps through mm -hmm. Odium's control and realizes, you know, what have I done? I yeah. am. Um, okay. I will just say that this maybe doesn't make sense for Moash because of the way that Moash ends Rhythm of War. What, I can't remember blind? if we talked about that on the regular podcast or just the Patreon podcast. Which you can definitely join, become a patron at Patreon, <laughs> and you can get special bonus episodes. But we talked about. The way that Moash ends the book and just this like really strange sequence of events where he is fleeing from the tower as Navani bonds the sibling. And it seems like he he maybe like falls and hits his spine or something and he becomes paralyzed and he's blind and the fused come and like take him to recuperate. And then I think it says, like, all of his feeling comes back. He just doesn't have eyesight anymore. And it just seems like this is going to be a big turning point for Moash to, like, maybe do some inner reflection, you know, do the work. Well, <laughs> and, if, if... <laughs> and so I think if book five was going to be Kaladin and Moash just, like, still fighting, I don't know. I would like to see some growth from Moash. Maybe that's not in the cards, but... I'm optimistic. Well, here's an idea. Um, and what I think happens in that scene is it's when he's fleeing and the the tower light, like the wave of tower light is like chasing him. Yes. That's when he starts feeling and he starts realizing like, oh God, I killed Teft and all that mm, kind of stuff. But yeah, when, he gets, yeah. when he gets past it, I think it subsides. Like once he gets out of range of it, his like, it goes away because he stops panicking. His In that scene, he's like initially panicking because he's like, Odium, you promised that this wouldn't happen and I wouldn't have to feel. Yeah. But once he gets out of range of the tower, I think Odium's control resumes well, and he, he I don't doesn't think anymore. he gets out of range though. Like he gets, the light catches up with him, which is why he falls out of the sky. 
because the tower's defenses have been turned onto the fused again instead of onto the knight's radiant. So as he's flying away, the the defenses the yeah, yeah catch which, up with him, which is why he falls out of the sky and Which is also back. crazy because doesn't he still use Stormlight, but it stopped him from being able to fly? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a question mark of like... <laughs> the... Although, is the tower running on Stormlight or is it now running on Warlight? It would have to be Tower Light, right? Not... Yeah any of the others at least to power the full tower itself i feel like all mm. the others would just be very inefficient forms of energy like you know putting regular gasoline in a diesel i'm trying to remember what song they sing at the end it's they so it is it is tower light that like oh, reawakens the tower i'm pretty sure but i don't think regardless of whether it's tower light or not it still shouldn't lock down stormlight if kaladin and everybody else is still able to use stormlight but yeah. it works against Mosh for some reason. That's a good point. Because I guess it, it reads it that he's a- It can feel that he's just subsumed with odium. Well, and then if we think about how Ruin had control over all of the Coloss and sometimes other characters as well. Remember, he had that bit of metal that was somewhere in their body and then that like allowed Ruin in. What if odium has a- similar type of loophole where the Parshendi and some of the creatures on Rashar have the obvious, the gem heart. What if Moash was like imbued with a gem heart or something oh that then gosh. allows Odium's control to that's like why he's being worked on. I think that's way too far out on yeah. a limb. <laughs> I, uh, same. <laughs> Just like jumping right off over the cliff the over Eritrea. <laughs> Okay, let's get to some of these other death rattles, though. Aaron, were there any other ones that you thought maybe were like oaths? Were oaths? Um, there's a couple that could be. There's less of a case for them. There's one that I think is possible, but I honestly don't really know what to do with this one. <laughs> and I think you're gonna you're gonna big disagree with me on this one. Okay. Uh, this is the quote: "He must pick it up. The fallen title, the tower, the crown, and the spear." Initially, I got super excited when I saw this one. Mm -hmm. And I remember I texted you and I was like, think of all the things this could mean. <laughs> and you were like, this just applies to when Kaladin saves Dalinar at the tower. It all checks out. And <laughs> I, you've even talked about that on the podcast before. And I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense. But why I've kind of backed off that like definition for this death rattle is because Kaladin has had one death rattle per oath for each of his oaths. I think that's- Well, uh, except for the make first pretty... two, right? The first two yes, are Yes, his one. first two, I guess, are combined. Yeah. So I guess if you say that this should apply to his first oath and the other one should apply to his second oath, sure. you can make that argument. Yeah. Okay. But it seems odd to me that Brandon would use two of his death rattles just to to do the same thing twice, I guess. Yeah. Maybe it's in the, the first book, so maybe he was just focusing harder on the first book. But I think this could have implications going forward. I still think that this could apply to the whole son of Tanavast argument mm. in some way. What I think is interesting and can't be a coincidence about this death rattle is the fact that the Colin family stylizes their like family glyphs into the tower and the crown. True. You know? And so then I was thinking maybe this is foreshadowing Kaladin like becoming part of the Colin family or like taking over for Dalinar or something. And then he adds, you know, the Kaladin spear to the glyph family. I don't know. Well, that's actually well, at least somewhat interesting because clearly we would say Kaladin is represented by the spear. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if Dalinar goes down in a blaze of the final dual glory... Both Adolin and Renarin would have to be out of the picture right. for Kaladin, Kaladin to have any type of setup. But sure. Renarin and Adolin don't have children or any like established line at this point. Yeah. So also, go ahead. Navani Aaron. would have to be out of the picture as well, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, they can definitely have queens take over. It's just like a, uh, a lot of things would have to go very, very wrong for Kaladin to to ever be to be the next colon yeah but i do think that the idea of maybe there's a secret love child daughter that kaladin can marry <laughs> the idea of the tower the crown then guarded by the spear and like adopting kaladin 
into the family makes a little bit more sense than him leading the family or like being the namesake of the family. Yeah. It would be a concept of like incorporating the spear into the tower and the crown. I think the key to understanding this death rattle is just is what the fallen title is. Yes. If we knew mm-hmm. that, this would be super easy to to figure out what it meant, but yeah. we don't know that. It could be all sorts of things. It could be honor, it could be the Colin house, it could be storm blessed uh, or radiant, just like yeah. most yeah. simple. <laughs> It could be all sorts of things. Like, I think I even said in my notes, this could just as easily apply to uh, the fourth ideal when he saves the tower uh, for, you know, with Navani. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a way, you know, he also picks up the fallen title of Storm Blessed and comes out of retirement and saves the tower, the crown, which would yeah. be Navani in this case, and picks back up the spear at the end of the of the thing. So it, could it's be very so hard. There's a lot of things this could be. <laughs> Could I reference one that just like I don't understand as well, Yeah. but I think is a perfect example of how a very simple death rattle can then spiral out into a bunch of different theories and people talking about stuff. Let's do it. This death rattle is, quote, 10 people with sharp blades alight standing before a wall of black and white and red. Ooh, I like this one. What uh, what do you like about it? Or what do you feel about this one? So when I was putting the spreadsheet together and I read it initially, I was like, oh, this is just a death rattle from the past. It's just talking about the Heralds. Uh, ba da ba, let me file it away. And then I went through the death rattles again and I went, there's very, f- there's no death rattle that we can concretely place as taking place in the past before the books have started. There are some that end like yeah. that hint at it. Yeah. But there's none where you're like, okay, this absolutely took place before the book started. And so I was thinking about this one with a new lens. What if this is foretelling the future rather than the past? Mm-hmm. In which case, there's a couple things that could point at. The first thing that comes to mind to me is the Battle of Thalen Fields, where during that... Are there period, exactly um, 10 shard bearers in that situation? Yes, there are exactly 10 shard bearers. And Dalinar, when he's like, you know, uniting the realms, feels like there should be exactly 10. And he only sees nine. And he's like, where's the other one? And the Stormfather's like, don't worry about it, dude. We have bigger problems. But we, of course, know the other one is Venli. But that could be a situation where 10 people with shard blades alight stood against an army of Parshendi. Okay. Right? I really like um, that. Although call. it really would only be nine because Venli didn't right. help. Have a shard. She wasn't really standing against them. <laughs> yeah. And some of them didn't have shard blades, too. So, hmm. Or, no, maybe it's Renarin. What do you mean? He would have had well, to be counted. Renarin is like hidden from, you know, Odium's sight. So maybe he would be hidden oh. from being able to see him as a shard bearer as well because he's bonded to a weird spren. But Dalinar counts him in the in oh. the count because he's a truth watcher. He's the <laughs> representative of the truth watchers. I like that concept. And it always is good to remember that like Renarin can't be seen by future sight and perhaps all he of- just yeah makes everything go a little haywire it's it's very a very cool ability um, i don't know if i would call it a, an ability as much as it's like a gift <laughs> it's not really yeah. something he like uses or does it just like is renarin well yeah it's it's not a skill that he has <laughs> yeah exactly it's just it's a, a condition <laughs> that just seems to be renarin's lot in life every time he gets something cool it's like no it's it's not a it's not a like ability you get it's just a condition it can yeah. never be simple now. yeah <laughs> this just happens now even his future telling he doesn't get to control it just like happens to him anyway the the other thing that i think this this death rattle could apply to is foretelling a future oath pact rather than a past oath pact. Mm, because we've speculated a little bit about that concept I of a future oath pact. I just really don't want to believe that there is going to be a future oath pact. When you started talking about it, you actually made me think your like objections that it's not likely actually made me think it's more likely because no, you were like, no. why? Well, well, let me explain. Let me explain. Because you were like, why is Dalinar so obsessed with the oath pact when the last Oath Pack didn't work like at all. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, there's some argument to be made. It's a, t- you know, it's a tool in his arsenal. And as a soldier, he wants to make sure he has every tool available. He knows that this worked in the past for at least some period of time, yada, yada. But when you made me think about it, I was like, yeah, it's kind of a stretch to have him really look into this if it wasn't going to come into play later on in the story. 
Yeah. And that's what really made me think yeah. the reason Dalinar cares about it is because he's going to have to use it at some point. Well, maybe Dalinar will die in the contest of champions. <laughs> then there will be Just so no, there can be no stupid oath back. back. I do think that at least that far future of the Cosmere that we talked about, we can't get too far ahead of the idea that like there are shard bearers in the future. Or excuse me, not shard bearers. There are spren bonded individuals in the future from rashar we don't even know that though i don't think we can say that with certainty because of the democratization of magic and technology Ooh, that's that a great point might happen i completely so, like, retract yeah that shard bearer we see in six of the dusk Wouldn't that be could amazing? be literally anything i just mean to say that the utter destruction route of Rashar or the like complete annihilation of the planet is what a lot of these death rattles point to. And we're going to talk about in just a second. And I am preemptively saying, I don't think that's going to happen. I think Rashar is going to be all right. And it's not going to be all bad for Dalinar and the team after Stormlight 5. This might just be me trying to protect okay. myself from <laughs> well, loss. Since you've given away the end of the story before we even started it why don't we go back to the beginning of this theory yeah let's tarantino this situation <laughs> yeah perfect there was your flashback at the beginning because the be so many of these death rattles are looking at the almost like apocalyptic future or possible future for rashar and so i want to start with this one quote i have seen the end i have heard it named the night of sorrows the true desolation the everstorm end quote. And there's been a lot of speculation about this one online, specifically pointing out that the true desolation and the Everstorm are different things. You know, the Everstorm is very definitively a specific storm that is happening. And the true desolation is the return of all of the fused, etc. And so the Night of Sorrows seems like it should also be a completely separate thing. Like these are not synonyms for the same event, but actually three different events happening. And so since we've seen the two, what is the Night of Sorrows going to be? I don't particularly subscribe to this theory. No. Even even in the uh, the way that this is punctuated, uh, it's implied that the Night of Sorrows and the True Desolation are descriptions of the Everstorm. They're diff like they're different names for it. But if we ignore that, because that's really shaky, and I'd be the first to admit that the Everstorm is the reason that the this is a true desolation, as in this is a desolation that you cannot escape from. Because Odium says, even if I'm bound and I'm sent away, yeah, they can still come back because the Everstorm is permanent now. You can't get yeah. rid of it. So I, I see the Everstorm as being the true desolation, which makes it hard to argue that there's a separate definition for the Night of Sorrows. And it's not something that seems to have been brought up much at all going Sense. forward. Yeah. It's yeah. just that a desolation is a period of time, right? Like it's That's multiple true. years, sometimes event. multiple centuries. It's a period of time, not a single night so true you know i don't think you can say that they're the same thing i guess unless we're doing like a dark ages type thing and they're just going to call that entire period of time the night of sorrows because it was like one long dark night or well, something and they could also just refer to the arrival of the everstorm every time it like comes through as a night of sorrows given that it blots That's out great. everything yeah and is like super dark and lightning and stuff like it's so very sorrowful yeah <laughs> scary and sorrowful i did see one theory that found out that the night of sorrows is a translation of an actual event that happened in history on earth um and i think the original is in spanish or an indigenous language to uh south, south america referencing an expulsion of the indigenous people from their land, basically. And so this person was postulating that perhaps the parallel of calling this the Night of Sorrows is foreshadowing an event where all of the humans, or at least humans not loyal to Odium, get expelled from Rashar. That would be a really big like turn of events 
where we had the group that we were introduced to, and obviously the humans, are really responsible for that kind of like that new world takeover from our own history and like the the period of the Colombian exchange where a bunch of indigenous people are pushed out and then we you and I and everyone that's listening to this were like dropped into the, that world many centuries later as were the people in Stormlight Archive and then what if they live through the reversal about like <laughs> when they are now on the receiving end of all of that atrociousness and and horrors and it becomes a refugee story of the humans right. and then they're like traveling across the cosmere yeah or something. pushed out across the cosmere and then that makes me think of obviously yim the tailor or the shoemakers ah the fourth land yeah thing about traveling through the lands and like we already know they came from ashen to rashar and then if they get kicked out of rashar they have to go somewhere else i have another apocalyptic death okay. rattle we'll call it okay quote light grows so distant the storm never stops i am broken and all around me have died i weep for the end of all things he has won oh he has beaten us end quote definitely to me it seems like a scary possibility of if odium wins or after odium has won but the storm never stopping can obviously be metaphorical and could just be like, oh, the storm's going to go on forever because we lost. Or, and I think this is part of the I mean, apocalypse. Since we have huge storms on Rishar, I'm going to say it's literal. But those storms <laughs> do stop occasionally. It is not a... Well, they don't stop. They just cycle. That's true. They yeah. circle the planet. It's always raining somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> don't they come from the east though as like isn't there a source or have we really not explored we've only enough? seen this from the perspective of the alethi so yes it always approaches from that direction but it just circles the planet in theory we know the everstorm does but mm -hmm. circle the planet but the whenever storm... someone starts their journey with the storm father it always starts with passing over roshar they never see any other part of the world other than roshar uh you mean alethkar Yes. Yeah. Then a yeah, I, th I think you're right. The high storms might still have an origin point, but the mm -hmm. ever storm circles around. Yeah. But to go back to the death rattles, there's a bunch of different death rattles that reference uh, endless rain. Yeah. Being really cold and like the land freezing. There's one about like the ground crumbling. Let's go to some of these just so we can like hit them all in a row and they're all kind of on the same theme. Go ahead, Aaron. So this one quote, the day was ours, but they took it. Stormfather, you cannot have it. The day is ours. They come rasping and the lights fail. Oh, Stormfather. This is one referencing the lights failing and everything mm. going dark. Mm hmm. Did you want to take uh, another one, Brooke? Quote, the darkness becomes a palace. Let it rule. Let it rule. End quote. That one's cool. This one, quote, I'm cold. Mother, I'm cold. Mother, why can I still hear the rain? Will it stop? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. And to me, that one is both interesting, but this concept of like, why can I still hear the rain? Will it stop? Is reminiscent of how Kaladin feels about the weeping and just like that forever rain for two weeks or something and maybe brings up a concept of like the the storms not being as destructive or violent but just like the whole planet uh being in a way different climate or just like an always weeping even between the storms there's a weeping and it's just like always raining yeah, well, some people have speculated that the Night of Sorrows is going to be some kind of event that causes like the high storms to stop completely and keeps them in a perpetual state of the weeping. And so they would be deprived of stormlight because the high storms would not be coming. Ooh, I actually had uh, a theory about that. Ooh, okay, tell uh, us. Because with the creation of anti- Stormlight and anti void light, we've seen that Spren can now be killed like for good. Mm -hmm. And the Stormfather is not only a Spren, he's also bonded to the guy who's going to be fighting in a battle to the death. So if there was ever an opportunity to use Dalinar to kill the Stormfather, it would be during that battle. That's and that a great would point. probably cause more chaos than just the death of Dalinar 
as a human because we know that the entirety of at least large portions of Rashar are actually reliant on the high storms for like the delivery I mean, yeah. of creme, the way that their crops all work, like every part of their society is built on these high storms. It always seems like a bad thing because it's like, you know, they go hide in their cubby holes. But it's the if the high storms stopped because of the death, yeah, not of they don't have electricity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's just like very quickly you would be in a a dark age or just unable to live as a fully functional society that could set them back for decades or hundreds of years, which is really scary to think about. I have one more death rattle that I want to read, and then I'm going to give you a completely crazy theory. Oh, perfect. We love the crazy theories. About the end times on Rishar. (laughs) Okay. Quote, they break the land itself. They want it, but in their rage, they will destroy it. Like the jealous man burns his rich things rather than let them be taken by his enemies. They come, end quote. And my thought was that this particular one, along with all of these other death rattles about sort of the the environment, the planet itself crumbling or changing, almost seem like these death rattles are foretelling like a Ragnarok situation or like an end of all things, the rapture type thing on this planet anyway, because the end of your world is, you know, the end of the world. Yeah. (laughs) And so I thought, what if like Dalinar actually wins and then, you know, Odium promised he like wouldn't harm Rashar itself, but if he took a shot at the moons or the sun in that system, it would have the same effect of like destroying life on Rashar, but he would still technically be within the bounds of his agreement. That would so, be like, worse you're forever. <laughs> that would, that yeah, would like how bad would that be? You're Indian. like, we won. And then Odium's just like, well, I just got rid of all of your moons and like reduce your sun by half or something you would immediately be in an ice age yeah like all of your weather weather patterns would be effed up so maybe that's why it's raining all the time so that's my crazy theory dalinar dalinar wins but odium throws a hissy fit exactly. and blows up the galaxy yes. because he's like <laughs> cosmic hissy fit <laughs> uh i actually kind of like that i don't know how likely it is but i do like it There is this death rattle that may or may not have meaning on that theory as well. Quote, so the night will reign for the choice of honor is life. End quote. We know honor is dead. And I, this concept of just the long night uh, to go back to Game of Thrones or just the night winning, I think is very on point. There's also this one, quote, the day was ours, but they took it. Stormfather, you cannot have it. The day is ours. They come rasping and the lights fail. Oh, storm father, end mm. quote. Yeah. So another one that's like, well, we won, but we also lost. <laughs> the day was ours, but they took it. Yeah. Like everything Sore was going losers. well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, I think that the caveat that we mentioned earlier about maybe having like some type of innocent or, you know, another role reversal, but I could see it go both ways. Either they like preemptively dishonor the deal or after the duel is won by the good guys the bad guys are going to do whatever they can to ruin the situation that's uh that's entirely possible a couple things that's important to uh sort of establish here is one all of these are coming from molak right who is definitely not the most objective uh source of information so I think a lot of these that like foretell a ominous ending where everyone is is sad and Odium wins. I think he's showing not only what Odium wants other people to see, but kind of what Odium wants to see themselves. Like this is the end that Odium sees mm. when they use fortune and look at at what's going to be. This is the end that they want. Yeah. But it's not necessarily the end that we'll get. I think that's actually a really good point that one, we have no way of discerning whether or not Moalach is exempt from Odium's corruption of any type of future site, right? Like Odium could be completely controlling all of the all of these death rattles. 
and they could not be true at all. And then my thought on kind of on this tangent was that we have no way of discerning whether or not Moloch would perceive time in a straight line. <laughs> because time doesn't have to be a straight line. And so some of these, like you mentioned at the very beginning, like some of them kind of seem like maybe they're actually talking about the past or the person who's giving the death rattle is seeing through the eyes of a past human to a future or something. You know, it doesn't seem to be really clear cut in terms of timeline. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because one thing that I, is really fascinating to me when looking through all these death rattles is trying to figure out who's actually saying mm -hmm. what's being said. Because mm -hmm. some of this stuff, like like there's one that is the meaning of it is pretty like commonly understood, but the whoever's talking about it is super interesting to me. It's they come from the pit two dead men, a heart in their hands, and I know that I have seen true glory. And so this one, basically everyone speculated, is Kaladin and Shallan emerging from the chasms and words of radiance. Mm -hmm. It's pretty obvious because it's, it's they're two people who are presumed dead and they come back out, they have the gem heart, and there's even a glory spread in the scene where Dalinar meets them. All of those line up pretty well. But what's interesting to me about it is the fact that it says two dead men, which could refer to their genders, and has some interesting implications on like Moalak maybe doesn't understand like the difference between gender. Mm. He's just like, oh, it's mm -hmm. two dead humans. But it also could imply that whoever is like speaking this is Parshendi, like men as opposed to Parshendi, sure. which is another race on Rashar. But no one at that scene was Parshendi. No one, the person who's like dying and says it isn't Parshendi. So it's it's very interesting. That phrasing is very interesting to me. Yeah, that is always a good question because we have to remember that the the speaker of these death rattles is not the same person as the experiencer of the death rattles. Right. And that yes. is throwing a lot of loops. But what I think you're pointing out, Aaron, is that there should be a person or entity that is experiencing these moments and that that has like a corresponding nature. So it's to me, a very open-ended question about like who is the the viewer or the experiencer of all of these different death rattles, and then how does that apply? Yeah, I mean, and we have an indication that shows that these are like experiences from a specific person's perspective right. in the Telenolot one, uh, which mm -hmm. is just in case the burdens of nine become mine, why must I carry the madness of them all? Oh, almighty, release me. That's the uh, word. 99.9% .9 sure that's to learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Unless so that it's from another sense. oath pact in the future and it's someone else. Yeah. Oh the same God. thing happens. No. The cycle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was just thinking some of these could be referring to past events. We have no way of knowing that Molak has any kind of linear sense of time and that sort of like we've been watching Foundation, which is really good. And there's this thing called psychohistory and foundation, which is basically being able to predict what will happen in the future because of what has happened in the past. And so maybe that's why some of these seem like they're talking about past events. Maybe they are talking about past events, but maybe that's because they have something to say about the future. Well, and to me, there's a whole bunch of questions because we know that the death rattles were like hunted and collected by Teravangian because he wanted assistance. To supplement the diagram. Yeah, assistance to correct or supplement the diagram. And the problem being, or at least what I see as the problem, is that the death rattles and the diagram don't necessarily come from the same place or source. My understanding is mm. that the death rattles are far more connected to the spiritual realm and future sight, where, it, as we have previously discussed, Teravangian's diagram is basically done by intelligence and maybe some assistance from the stones, or basically like you said with psychohistory, having a very clear record of the past, allowing you to make very accurate predictions, predictions about the future. But you're not actually That's a seeing good point. the future, mm -hmm. but the death rattles seemingly 
are actually seeing these events. Yeah. And so that is, to me, always stuck out as a different kind of between the two. But then Taravangian is going off looking for these, you know, spiritual guidance, basically, from the death rattles. And I find that to be like a counterpoint to his his diagram. And so maybe that's actually a flaw in the process. As Hoyd warns us, I'm always very worried about any people who say that they can predict the future. And that's definitely what these death rattles seem to be doing in general. So how much credit do we give to them? Speaking of Hoyd, Ooh. there is a death rattle that mentions a black piper. Ooh, yes. Which like... I feel like it oh. has to be Hoyd, but Aaron, you made a note that it wasn't Hoyd. Is that a word of Brandon? Yeah. So let me let me step in. That is 100% a word of Brandon. Someone Damn asked it. him if that referred to Hoyd, and Brandon actually answered and said, no, it does not refer to Hoyd. Darn. Um, there are a couple Who things that Brandon- Who else could be a Black Piper? Come on. That one flummoxes me completely. I have no idea what that one's even talking about. Why and don't just we say, that one on let's the read mic. it. Yeah. yeah. Here is that one. Quote, he watches the Black Piper in the night. He holds us in his palm, playing a tune that no man can hear. End quote. Clearly throwing out, uh, you know, playing a tune, a watcher in the night, kind of bigger than the circumstances. Hoyd it's, wears all black. It he has a freaking flute. But Brandon says no. There is another Black Piper out there who is holding everyone in his palm. Yeah, the only other person we've seen with a pipe is the pipe that uh, is Kaladin, who got given the pipe by Hoyd. And <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, just a shot in the dark here, I don't think it's Kaladin. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> a couple other things that Brandon has said about death rattles is one, somebody asked him if all the death rattles would be seen throughout the story. But as we know, the story's actually changed significantly even since he wrote the first thing. And which is why I think that the death rattles we see in later novels have more weight to them mm. than the death rattles that we see in in book one. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the choice of honor is life one that we read earlier. That one is actually from book two, I believe. So that is interesting to me because it's likely he had more of the story plotted out by the time he got to the second book than the first one. So Brandon can be more accurate with his future predictions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he he did say that not every death rattle is going to be seen. And the ones that aren't seen will be assumed to have happened off screen. So it's right. possible this Black Piper one will just never be referenced again and it'll just go off into the ether. <laughs> go off into the sunset. Yeah, because there is another one that I at least found interesting because it was revealed to me in the most interesting way. We like had started learning about the Death Rattles, learning that Taravangian was, you know, doing his thing. But then we get the death of a character in Bridge 4 maps who dies and has a death rattle or seemingly has a death rattle so it wasn't like one of the purposefully collected one it's yeah, just something it's not we an saw in world yeah yeah and so when maps dies he says quote and all the world was shattered the rocks trembled with their steps and the stones reached towards the heavens we die we die end quote see ragnarok Definitely throwing out the apocalyptic vibes. I also think that the question of, is this an event that happened in the past? Is it one that is going to happen in the future? Or like Aaron was just mentioning, is it something that's happened off screen or will happen off screen? Aaron, hit us with another one. Okay, so let's look at this one. Quote, the love of men is a frigid thing, a mountain stream only three steps from the ice. We are his. O oh, Stormfather, we are his. It is but a thousand days and the Everstorm comes. So there's a couple things that are really cool about this yeah, one Yeah, this me. is a really good one. One, three steps from the ice. He's referencing, well, a mountain stream and ice, which is, you don't actually see a lot of ice in Roshar because Roshar is actually, I guess it's in the Southern Hemisphere. So the further south you, or the further north you get, the colder it gets, which is why the Frostlands are in the north, I think. I could yeah. be wrong. Yeah, about I that. think that's right. When you try and think of like what c characters from which land are even gonna like be familiar with ice or understand how that works in the context of their environment, it would be like, Thalen, South Shin, mm -hmm. and the Horn Eaters. Like that would be it yeah. if you try and think about yeah, who's talking in this. Yeah, my thought is that this. it's the Horn Eaters because they're talking about like mountains and ice and it just but, seemed like Horn Eater to me. 
But in the next sentence, they swear by the storm father, which makes no sense for the horn eaters to do because their whole worship system is mm. completely different. That's true. And then the other thing that is really special about this one to me is it has, it specifically states a time. This is the only yes. death rattle that we can actually place in a timeline, which is crazy. And the timeline's incorrect. What do you mean? Given what we know about the Rasharan calendar, because we know the Rasharan calendar and like can completely plot out everything, which is why there is an amazing interactive map of Rashar online that some awesome fans have made, where you can pick any day in time on the Rasharan calendar and they have plotted any events that either happen or have been referenced. So we know the Rasharan calendar and we know when this death rattle was given. And the death rattle was actually given 1,229 days before the Everstorm came, not 1,000 days. <laughs> so the thought is that the speaker of the death rattle is channeling someone who predicted the Everstorm exactly 229 days before the death rattle was given. And that person is Renarin. After the death rattle was given, 229 days. If, if it was 1,229 yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. days. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Wow. But that, okay, so that is super interesting. You're saying the death rattle was for ease, 1,200 days before the Everstorm, but it is quoting something from 1,000 days. Yes. And that person who is capable of foreseeing the Everstorm could have been Renarin. So yes. it's like a death rattle through the eyes of Renarin yes. who has seen the future because yes. he's a truth watcher. Wow. <laughs> That is wow. quite a few little loops that Brandon worked <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, and I think that's like just a great example of how complex and like time weird these death rattles can be, which is what I was like trying to explain earlier, but probably did a really bad job of. But like Jeremy Bear Me yeah, is exactly. basically all it's you need to know. Loopies. That's crazy because to me, I kind of thought more along the lines of a thousand days is when things get a little loopy from prediction land. Like it's too far out in the future mm. to predict. Mm -hmm. And so like it gets, uh, you know, it got delayed by 200 days for some reason in that span. Just too many different things happen. But I like this concept that it is seen through the eyes of someone who has then seen the future yeah, from a well, thousand days out. And I think also just the th concept that these death rattles are maybe not seeing that far into the future you know like in this case this person mm -hmm. would only be saying 200 days into the future and i feel like when i read them i am feeling like they are you know years ahead that we're really like seeing you know, when i think of the future it's yeah. like a long way away or the long past right yeah and it's like this really could be just like tomorrow <laughs> which would make yeah. sense from my perspective and understanding of the three realms and the way that cosmere works on just like a structural level if there is some spiritual realm explanation for the death rattles it would just be like exposure to the spiritual realm while you are dying for whatever reason that's kind of what the description of moalak is which yeah. is basically like he comes into the equation at the moment when your soul is like Jumping. somewhat exposed yes. to the spiritual realm and sort of helps channel a bit of that through you. But the thing that you would be exposed to is just your immediate surroundings. And so like the immediacy- I don't of the think we can say that about the spiritual this realm. This is my speculation okay. to basically support what you were saying though about all of these being- of events that are pretty close to you is like if you got dropped mm. into the spiritual realm, you would just look around, not that you can do this, but you would just look around and maybe see, oh, there's like what's happening 200 days in the future. But you don't actually have the capability sure. of seeing far into the future or far into the past in the same way that like we cannot see outside of the 14 billion year light sphere that makes up our universe. But the that's only because light hasn't had enough time to travel. That may be too deep for this podcast. That's pretty deep. Excellent. That's crazy. Aaron, I, did you I, have anything, for that. anything else to say about the timeline and stuff on that one? 
Um, I think you guys, I mean, you, I think you covered it pretty well, Brooke. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say is I don't, I'm not sure that this is Renarin just because the language to me actually does seem more like something the Horn Eaters would mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. because of the way it's written, right? It's very, it's almost poetic the mm -hmm. way that it, this is written. But then they talk about the Stormfather. Maybe it's translated from Horn Eater talk. So they have a word for the Stormfather. That's just a different word. But since everything's translated, whoever's speaking this is probably speaking it in Alethi, and then it's translated again to English. It's right. just things get kind of crazy at that point. But there was one one last one that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, which I don't actually want to talk about the content of the death rattle, but I want to talk about who said it. Okay. And it is the, a lot of people probably remember this one. It stuck out to me when I read it. Quote, I wish to sleep. I know now why you do what you do, and I hate you for it. I will not speak of the truths I see. This was collected by the Silent Gatherers from a Shin sailor left behind by his crew, reportedly for bringing them ill luck. What's crazy to this for me is, one, this is one of the few that actually specifies the ethnicity of the speaker. Some of them will specify that they're dark-eyed or light-eyed, mm -hmm. but one, I, I don't think any of the other ones specify the ethnicity of the speaker aside from this one. And this is also the only death rattle where the person seems entirely conscious of mm -hmm. what's currently going on. And not only that, is able to refuse to speak of the visions that they're seeing. They're so in control of themselves yeah. or they have some other special quality that they're able to basically say, no, like, screw you guys. <laughs> Yeah. I think that's a great point. This one does stand out as the only one where the speaker, for some reason, isn't compelled to speak what they are seeing. Yeah, he's you actually know? not rattling, or they are not <laughs> rattling off at the end of their life. It's a death silence, not a death rattle. Yeah, it's just a, a chosen word. It's like the person who plans their last words right before going out is just like, no, I see what you're trying to do, and I don't like you. Goodbye. <laughs> and that's the end i find it super interesting that maybe the shin have an awareness of either molak and the, the forces that are doing this but maybe even like why these death rattles exist or what is trying to be used like it yeah brings I mean, up a lot of questions more about the shin yeah we have we have so many questions about the shin they do seem to have maybe a deeper understanding of the power is at work on Rashar because we know they their religion is stone shamanism. And so they seem to know the somewhat sentience slash like memory slash maybe future abilities of the stones. And so it seems like they would also be kind of familiar with the unmade. We know that they're familiar with all of the surge binding skills from practicing with the honor blades. So I think it's a good hint that the Shin have a lot of knowledge and skills that enable them to do things like resist the death rattles. That's a really interesting tie-in to their stone shamanism and then the knowledge that we have talked and I've mentioned previously about how the stones contain that knowledge. And it is, of course, the Shin who are, we believe, most similar to the Ashen people or the people from ashen and i just have a lot of questions obviously that's the point of book five you're supposed to have a lot of <laughs> questions leading into when they go travel to shinovar but i think this is one of the best call outs about a person who refuses to speak the truths that they see and going against this other model that we've seen of death rattles. Aaron, are you good? Yeah, I mean, there's there's more. I could talk about this for like three hours, but... Mm -hmm. I think that just about does it. I mean, th there are more death rattles. We dove deep. Yeah, there are <laughs> we lots of crazy... We time and space and... <laughs> the extent of the universe and how it has no edge. All types of weird things. And most importantly, we didn't even cover all of the death rattles. We didn't even cover all of the theories that are connected to the death rattles. And that is part of what I love about the Cosmere and the fandom, about how yes. there is so much speculation and interest in these relatively small parts of the books. And we have to say a big thank you to Aaron for being here on the pod with us today and bringing us all of these great death rattle theories. Thanks for being here, Aaron. 
Yeah, no problem. I am super happy and like honored to be on the podcast with you guys. It's amazing. And I really like taking small stuff like this and just trying to go as in-depth as possible, even though like you you really have to stretch to, to do a lot of this stuff. But I that's what I find fun is really trying to get the most information out of even the tiniest little bits of information. And I think that Brandon likes that as well. Like he's not putting these things, he's not writing the epigraphs, he's not making all these connections just for his own enjoyment. I think it's about the entire experience that we are all able to have here. Always remember that you can find us on your social medias at the Facebook and Reddit and whatnot. There is also a Patreon feed where we have extra special bonus episodes we're gonna start our book club for skyward and starsight and soon cytonic over on the patreon so if you want to chat about those books join us over there it has been so nice to talk to aaron always nice to talk to you brooke and until next time can you take us away life before death strength before weakness journey before destination